us about processing biggish data on commodity hardware, simple Python patterns. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. So it's really great to be here, and it's really great to have a French session chair because she can say my name properly. I think uh, <laughs> France is finally invading Texas. We've been working on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, this is meant to be a bit of a provocative uh, talk. I like to show you uh, how I tend to work because I'm in academia and I cannot use Hadoop because my system administrators don't want me to give root access uh, to get root access on the on the cluster. And uh, I want to to show uh, I want to show you how we can do things in a fairly simple way. I'm not going to talk about libraries. I'm going to talk about patterns mostly. All right, so we all hear about big data, and I used to think it was about terabytes, but Olivier corrected me, and it's about petabytes. It's about distributed so storage. It's about clusters, grid, cloud. It's about technology like Hadoop, Amazon Web Service, which I, I would love to be able to use. Uh, but uh, I am just, uh, I'm just part of the 99%. I have gigabytes of data. I'm leaning towards the terabyte, but still a lot of gigabytes. Um, I like. Python. I don't like Java. I don't really enjoy Hadoop. And I mostly work on off-the-shelf uh, computers. On the high end, I wrote six, uh, 16 CPUs because this is what I have, but my colleagues now they have 32 or more. Uh, uh, and I work with people who actually want to be able to process their data on this supercomputer. And I am not kidding. This is my day-to-day -day, um, user. So what's my tool stack? Well, Python, of course, and uh, NumPy and SciPy. And uh, in my experience, uh, the data community does not use the ND array uh, enough. I think it's changing. We can see it here. But I talk to people in the data community, and they're like, uh, I have text. You're taking NumPy arrays. How do I match this? Come to our tutorial. <clears throat> so I'll be talking about patterns. Uh, not focusing on the libraries themselves. I mean, you can come to the tutorials. You can uh, uh, lo look up the documentation if you're interested in the code themselves. Uh, but so all these patterns are implemented in Scikit-Learn and Joblib and many other libraries. Uh, and uh, if you are interested in how they are implemented, look up the code. So what I've learned across the years on how I like to design my software is I think the most important thing is about failing gracefully. I think, I think what I like most about Python and, and IPython is percent debug. If, if you don't use it, uh, Fernando is the one who actually showed it to me years ago. He was sitting next to me and, and, and looking at how it worked. And he told me, you know what? You want, to, you want to type percent debug. And ever since, I've been doing this every day. So it's about debugging. Something that I cannot debug easily will completely hinder my productivity. Uh, and, and I'm not going to use it. Uh, it's about being robust to errors. If I run something during the weekend and then come back, and the thing is crashed because of a print statement, that's a pity. Another thing I've learned, and I think this is extremely important, is about not solving hard problems. I've tried. Uh, it's about you know knowing the problem set that you can solve and knowing your actual problem and finding if you can if you can find a match. Uh, we all like you know to to show off and to show that we can do really really hard stuff. But at the end of the day, you're you're probably working on an application problem. How far can you? pull away from this application problem to be in your comfort zone. Can you decide not to solve a problem? I think it was Eric who, who taught me this. I don't know where Eric is, but he taught me, you know, worry about the 80%, not the 20%. And, and the cost uh, of those 20% is huge. Something I've learned across the years, being uh, uh, in academia in France is teaching me every day this that dependencies suck. Uh, mm, a lot of people are not right on their computer. A lot of people are in locked in environments. A lot of people, even they're, if they're root right on their computer, do not know how to use this computer. And of course, 
we're getting a biased crowd here. We're getting people who know how to, uh, uh, who are power users. But uh, my target users are medical doctors, they're neuroscientists. If I've got a big bunch of, uh, of dependencies, uh, they will not be able to install uh, my software on their favorite MacBook Air. Uh, and okay, it's a distribution problem. We can solve it, people are working on it, but it's an age-old problem. And finally, something that goes a bit against what I've said before is that performance does matter. Uh, you know, if you have to wait for code to finish, this eventually kills your productivity. You know, you take coffee breaks or, or you, you start looking at Twitter and eventually you're no longer focused. So that's my philosophy. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about big data and let's think about what has brought up speed ups in things like Hadoop, which is maybe one of the most famous big data technology, but let's also think about CPUs. CPU design has been around for before I was born, uh, and when you think about the progress that was made, both in Hadoop and CPU designs, it's about data flow programming. So knowing where your data comes from, how you can get, get it, and eventually, how you can move uh, uh, your uh, computing to the data. It's about parallel computing, and that plugs into um, uh, data flow. It's about the data access. So uh, for CPU, we've had cache, and then L1, L2, and then now I think we're N1, L2, L3 cache, and we've got local uh, RAM, and we've got the disk, and we've got the uh, remote storage. Uh, now, what's really interesting is that the CPUs have pretty much hidden this from the user. Hadoop hasn't. So it's about pipelines, but pipelines can get messy. It's about storage, but I don't want to use databases. All right, so a few patterns that I've picked. I'm going to talk about on-the-fly data reduction, about online algorithms. So these two are more algorithmic tricks. I'm going to talk about some patterns that I've seen in parallel processing about caching, and about how you can do fast I.O. without much. Talking about big data, I think it's important to separate two scenarios. One is I have many, many observations, which I will call samples. For instance, I'm learning from Twitter feed. Uh, this is what most people call big data. Now, if in, you're in bioinformatics, actually each sample is really hard to get. It's, it's scanning a subject. So you probably don't have that many. But uh, you might have a brain scan or a bunch of brain scans for subjects. So you're going to have a lot of descriptors, which uh, we call features in machine learning. I'm more in the second situation. I just think it's important to separate both. All right, on-the-fly data reduction. Why is it important? Because if you've got big data or big-ish data, it's often all you're bound. Uh, you need to... Uh, acknowledge that you have a uh, layered memory access. So if you can fit in CPU caches, you're going to be super fast. If you have to access RAM, well, it's going to be slower. Disk is way slower. And what completely kills you is going to distance storage. So we are less and less uh, um, CPU bound nowadays and more and more IO bound. Uh, another thing is that, in general, Less data also means less work. So if I have less data, I can go home earlier. Right, so what's the most common way of uh, having less data? Dropping data. It's a no number one technique used in real life. And one example of doing it is you loop over taking random fractions of the data, running your analysis on that fraction, and then you aggregate the results across the subsampients. So if your algorithm is super linear, it's going to go faster. But if you have multiple CPUs, which I think we all have, this is also going to go faster. So you just do a parallel loop. And this is great when your number of samples is very large. If your number of features is very large, you may want to do a dimension reduction. And the idea is that quite often individual features have a very low SNR. So you can do random projections, and I'll point you to the scikit-learn documentation for this, but the, the intuition is that you're just averaging features. And because your features are redundant with high probability, you're going to get a good summary. You can do fast and suboptimal clustering of these features. It works great on images. You're building things like uh, super pixels. 
you can do hashing. We discussed hashing yesterday. So if your observations have varying sides, for instance, uh, words, you just compute a quick hash of them, and then you've got a fixed size uh, uh, feature, uh, which really helps. <clears throat> One concrete example, the randomized SVD in scikit-learn implements uh, basically a random projection and then power iterations. And if we compare just a random big-ish data matrix, uh, uh, that's using only one CPU. So if we compare that to the standard Laypack solver, I believe that's an Atlas solver here, uh, that one is six seconds, and we believe it's fairly accurate. We take an R pack because we're interested only in the uh, 10 first components, that's 2.5 seconds. The randomized SVD is uh, 0.3 seconds, and it's bloody accurate. Very simple to code. All right, online algorithms. The idea is to process the data one sample at a time. All right, suppose you have to compute the mean of a gazillion numbers. Is that hard? Well, no, it's not. You just do a running mean, right? That's fairly easy to code. You can control your data access. So online algorithms are about this, doing running algorithms. And if you're drawing your data in an IID way, then they converge to expectations uh, of the distributions you're interested in. One trick is to uh, use many batches, so you don't do one sample at a time, but bunches of samples. Uh, just to be able to uh, exploit things like vectorization. And it's a trade-off between uh, uh, blowing up your memory and, and vectorizing. And one example is the mini-batch clustering. If you compare it to the uh, SciPy clustering, which is actually pretty good. I looked at it recently. That one on um, biggish data takes 11 seconds. Uh, Circuit learn mini-batch uh, means takes 0.6 seconds. It's not as good, but it's pretty close. Parallel processing, well, first thing, as far as I'm concerned, uh, life is too short to worry about deadlocks, so I focus only on uh, embarrassing parallel loops. One thing to keep in mind is that your workers are going to be competing for data access, whether you're on a multi-CPU uh, box, in which case your memory bus is going to be a bottleneck, and it's just surprising how much of a bottleneck it can be, or on grids, uh, in which case it's going to be the distributed storage. So you've got to find the right grain of parallelism. To find parallelism, you get overhead. To course, you're just, you get a memory shortage and you're just competing for a data access. So the right scale is the relevant cache pool. It may be actual CPU cache, it may be your local RAM, maybe your local disk. So, Coding parallel computing algorithm, and uh, we have very simple framework in Joblib that's as simple as you can get. There's one pattern that I see coming back over and over and over again, and it's in uh, ZeroMQ, it's in Hadoop, it's in RabbitMQ, it's the queue. The queue is really extremely important. And so here's a little uh, uh, toy picture of how you can have a parallel loop. Basically, you've got a caller which dispatches job. There's a dispatch queue, and then you've got workers which uh, processes the job. And they feed them uh, to the collect queue. Uh, so that's the big picture. The queues are great because they're pretty much, uh, uh, they worry about deadlocks uh, for you. You offload everything to a queue. Uh, now, uh, one thing that you learn quite quickly is that you don't want to fill up your dispatch queue uh, immediately. You want to fill it up as it empties. So now you get an interaction between probably the collect queue and the dispatch queue. And that is where it, it gets technically hard to code. Uh, this is coded in Joblib with a pre-dispatch uh, uh, keyword argument. And that's really the tricky part. Five minutes, all right. Uh, so one thing that's not in Joblib, uh, uh, but that we would like to have, is the Grand Central uh, uh, Dispatch Framework, where you uh, put your dispatch queue out of process, and then you can have several callers that are feeding it in. And so then you've got basically a job management. Uh, uh, having no Grand Central Dispatch makes Joblib more robust, but it doesn't scale as well. Caching. So why would you want caching? For reproducible science, because I've found that at least the people I work with, uh, they comment out uh, uh, um, uh, scripts. They run only part of their pipeline, and because just to make it faster. Uh, and then somebody forgets to comment out something. 
uh, for performance. It's just the crux of optimization is not recomputing what you've already computed. So Joblib exposes a very, very simple uh, caching approach. It's just you create a memory object, and then you can use it to decorate uh, functions, and it doesn't recompute uh, twice uh, the same function on the same um, uh, argument. So that's the memoized pattern. It's a well-known pattern. How do we make it work on big data? Well, the problem is both input and output arguments are big, uh, and they should be, as far as I'm concerned, arbitrary objects. I don't want dependencies on top of this. So how do you hash arguments? Uh, you compute an MD hash, and the way you do it is you subclass uh, uh, the standard library pickler. Uh, so what this, this object is, is just a state machine that wa walks the object graph. So once you have this, you can uh, change its logic to compute uh, uh, MD5 hashes when it's walking uh, the object uh, um, um, graph. And the trick is, if all your heavy data is in MD arrays, you just pass the data pointer to the MD5 algorithm, and that is actually really fast. So you're not pickling them by arrays. <clears throat> Same thing, you need a store. We use this base store, and we also subclass the pickler uh, to avoid pickling them by arrays uh, for the disk store. And if your uh, a directory layout is uh, well chosen, then you can handle concurrency in this. Uh, because basically you're on a, on a, a tri-accept uh, basis. If uh, 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 some files get erased, you just recompute them. This scales actually pretty well. So no locks in there, really important. All right, very quickly, I'm going over time. How do we make I.O. fast? You use compression because uh, CPUs are getting faster than disk. You chunk data uh, uh, for the right access pattern, and PyTables is really good at this. Uh, I'm relying on the standard library com uh, uh, compressor, which is Zlib. It's not fast, but it's reasonably good. One trick is it needs C contiguous buffers. And so to avoid, if you have a Fortran array, to avoid flipping it around, you just uh, store the buffer separately from the metadata. Uh, and this, uh, if you do this, these are performance uh, uh, summary. I'm not go going over them in detail, but uh, I'm comparing myself to PyTables. This is dependent on the kind of data you have, and I chose something that was in the middle of, of what I've uh, uh, seen. So Java doesn't do as, as good as PyTable. That is somewhat reassuring, but it gets close to it, uh, especially if I give fortune-ordered uh, fortune uh, uh, data to PyTables. Uh, it has no dependencies beyond the standard library. All right, so to wrap up, what I think I've learned uh, uh, in terms of processing biggish data is I need to worry about data reduction, and this will depend on my problem. I really need to code online algorithms. Uh, you know, I don't want distributed arrays. I don't want uh, uh, to each loop of my algorithm to process all my data. This is going to kill me. I want my algorithm to converge on expectancy, not exactly. I need some simple parallel processing patterns. I do need caching. This is really important. And I will need some fast IO for this. Uh, so one last message. In my experience, if you want to get a result quickly, keep everything as simple as you can. People really underestimate the cost of complexity. And I am looking for a programmer to work with me. Thank you. So the, I, I think the question was, uh, uh, the points seem to apply to big data to what would need to uh, 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 be added to the list uh, to process really big data. Well, I, I think my answer is you're going to have to get dependencies. Everything I talked about are toy. They're good toys. They scale reasonably well. We've used them on 1,000 nodes uh, clusters. But if you really want performance, you're going to have to worry about, about distributed file storage and not rely on, on your hard drive. You're going to worry about actual dispatch queues, not, not your simple dispatch queue. I think that's the big difference. The patterns do apply. The tools don't. Uh, what, what was it like processing all this on that MacBook Air? 
I, I don't have a MacBook Air, uh, but my MDs do. And uh, we haven't gotten there yet, but we need to because they're using other software that is not as, as optimal from the statistical standpoint than ours, but uh, that runs on their MacBook Air. And they want this. Uh, as far as I've seen and the way we've implemented it, you fall back to not giving the, yeah. You fall back to the yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I forgot to repeat the question. So the question is, okay, this is all nice and good to, to uh, um, um, hash uh, and the arrays uh, passing the, the data buffer to uh, the MD5 uh, 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 hasher, but what if your D-type is object? And the answer was, well, in this case, we treat it as a list. Well, we, we don't pass the data buffer, basically. We don't treat it as a list, though. Uh, can you uh, talk a little more about the underestimated complexity part of it? Any, uh, do, do you have any metric analysis about it? Uh, uh, could you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, can you clarify a little more on the complexity underestimated part? Um, how did you think? How did that come about? So the question is about the complexity. Oh, you mean, oh, this complexity. Uh, well, not really. I mean, I can quote papers from empirical software engineering that tell you that basically, uh, uh, it clearly, uh, uh, the cost of maintenance is super linear with the lines of code. Uh, but this is really based on my experience. And my experience is, is about, uh, well, the more coupling you have in a code base, the harder it's, it's going to, to get. Uh, the more uh, 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 advanced patterns you have, whether they're numerical or software engineering, the harder it's going to get. So you have a trade-off between sophistic uh, sophistication and and uh, simplicity and it's really important not to go t too much in the in, uh, in the advanced patterns uh, and that's true for everything it's true for numerics it's true for software engineering it's true for dependencies mm -hmm. so this is mostly for this uh, uh, applying uh, better so uh, software engineering skills than anything specific to data so the, the remark was this is mostly for applying better software engineering skills uh, than s things specific to data. Absolutely. This is completely general. It's just, my, my, my point here was just that uh, if you know these simple patterns and you know your data problem, you can probably assemble something that is reasonably simple. If you, if you want to do something generic, it's going to be a killer. <laughs>